Our next intermolecular force is called ion dipole. When a polar molecule, that is one that has a dipole, is near ions, those are molecules that have ionic bonds, which are not the same thing as covalent. The partial positive charge on the polar molecule will line up with the completely negatively charged ions, and the partial negative charge in the polar molecule will line up with the completely positively charged ions, like this. This is an example where I've got sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is completely ionic. Once again, make, please make the distinction in your minds. In an ionic bond, I've got more or less a complete transfer of electrons. The sodium gives up its single valence electron to the chlorine completely. They're not sharing. There's not a partial plus and a partial minus. It's a total plus and a total minus. The chloride and the sodium get into water and then dissolve with water molecules taking away the sodium and the chloride separating them. The partially negatively charged oxygens in water now line up with the positively charged cation in sodium, and the partially positively charged hydrogens in water line up with the negatively charged ion chloride. This is why sodium chloride dissolves so well in water, because water is so polar. This intermolecular force here, where I've got a force between a polar molecule, water, and a complete ion, chloride, or sodium, is called ion dipole. And it is a very strong intermolecular force. The next intermolecular force I'll teach you is dispersion forces. Keeping in mind that carbon and hydrogen atoms are almost equally electronegative, they're not totally electronegative, but they're really close. Do you think that the following molecule is polar or nonpolar? If you said nonpolar, you're right. If you said polar, so once again, carbons and hydrogens are more or less very, very close in electronegativity. So there's not a strong dipole or strong partially positively charged uh, center anywhere and a partially negatively charged center anywhere else. It's more or less very blah, very bland all the way across the molecule. So this kind of molecule would not have the same kind of stickiness to other molecules of itself that we would see in water or HCl or between water and sodium chloride. Because once again, there's not a strong partial negative and partial positive anywhere in this molecule to line up in a complementary fashion with another molecule itself to make them stick together intensely. Now that said, nonpolar molecules still can have momentary partial positive and partial negative charges. How? Well, because their atoms and electrons are constantly moving, you might imagine that there would be brief moments, brief moments, in which some of the atoms' nuclei will be partially exposed, which would expose, for just a moment, the partial positive charge from the protons in that nucleus, while other nuclei will have brief moments when all of the electrons are all over them, giving them partial negative charges. Thus, you can once again imagine that as a whole, this molecule isn't going to have strong partial negatives and partial positive charges, but there might be brief moments because the electrons are constantly moving around the, uh, between atoms, between carbons and hydrogens and carbons and carbons, in which there might be just a brief moment where there's a partial positive exposed and a partial negative somewhere else. These two videos to which I'll post external links and happen to both be narrated, I think, by robots, help illustrate that, and you're welcome to watch them to capture visual images of this. So when two molecules with momentary partial positive and partial negative charges line up in a complementary fashion, they can stick together in a complementary way like this. You can imagine, for instance, atom A and atom B having a brief moment in which all the electrons are on one side of atom A and are on the opposite side of atom B. So when they stick together, there's a momentary partial positive charge on one side of that atom and a partial negative charge on the other side of the atom and they'll, they'll stick together. Once they stick together, then the electrons start vibrating back and forth in a complementary way so that at any given moment, the partial positive on one atom is next to a partial negative on the other and vice versa. They start, in essence, resonating back and forth complementarily. Similar thing can happen between multiple atoms in molecules when molecules stack on top of each other. This type of intermolecular force is called a dispersion force, which is also known as London forces or Van der Waals forces. All molecules have dispersion forces, even molecules that also have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. So let's go ahead and review. At the top, we've got dispersion forces, also called London or Van der Waals forces, which are found in molecules that don't have dipoles, such as hydrocarbons, where all I've got is carbons and hydrogens that are roughly equally electronegative, or single elements all uh, sticking together, or other nonpolar molecules. 
Next in our lineup is dipole dipole. These are molecules that do have a dipole, that is one atom or more being uh, more electronegative than another so that there is a partial negative and partial positive somewhere contributing to sticking molecule on top of molecule. We see dipoles in molecules, once again, where there are larger differences in electronegativity, such as HCl, carbon oxygen, or sulfur hydrogen bonds. The next is hydrogen bonding. This is a kind of dipole dipole that is super strong, and it's specific to hydrogens that are bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Because those three elements are so much more electronegative than hydrogen, you have a very intense partial negative charge on them, while you have an analogously intense partial positive on the hydrogens. The last one is ion dipole. This occurs where you have a molecule that has a dipole in it interacting with another molecule that has an ionic bond, as would be the case with water and sodium chloride. The ions separate out interacting with the polar molecules with partial negatives pointing at complete cations and partial positives pointing at complete anions. These intermolecular forces are all listed, as I have shown here, in order from top to bottom of increasing strength. And for students who take this from me, I do require you to memorize the names and natures of these intermolecular forces, as well as knowing their relative strengths. Incidentally, intermolecular forces are responsible for molecules' boiling points. The stronger the intermolecular force, the harder it is to break apart, and hence the higher its boiling point will be. For example, if I've got a molecule like water, which has hydrogen bonding in it, that molecule will stick very intensely to other water molecules, and therefore I will have to crank in a ton of heat to get those molecules to separate from each other and convert from a liquid into a gas. By comparison, if I've got a molecule of similar size that only has dispersion forces, which are much weaker, it won't require as much heat to get them to convert from a liquid to a gas. This is, in fact, the reason why molecules like methane, ethane, and propane are gases at room temperature and pressure, while water, which has a very similar molecular weight, is a liquid at room temperature and pressure, because methane, ethane, and propane just have dispersion forces, and therefore don't stick together very intensely at all and will just be a gas at standard conditions, whereas water, which is a relatively small molecule, will stick very intensely to other molecules of water because it has hydrogen bonding. This flow chart, which I stole from a person behind the building after beating him senseless, okay, I really just borrowed it from the book, will help you determine what intermolecular force or forces are present for any given compound or situation. So to summarize, if two molecules with different molecular weights have the same kinds of intermolecular forces, then generally speaking, the one with the higher molecular weight will usually have the higher boiling point because there are more atoms to stick on top of each other, especially if you're talking about a vast difference in molecular weights. Now, if you have two molecules that have only London forces, Sometimes having a larger surface area can increase boiling point. For example, chlorine gas, Cl2, has a larger surface area and therefore a higher boiling point than krypton, even though krypton has a larger atomic weight. That takes us then to some cool problems. Identify the type or types of intermolecular forces present in each substance, and then select the one in each pair that has the higher boiling point. I invite you to try this on your own. If you want, you can click the link here in which I work out some of these for you. And this question, which type of intermolecular attractive force operates between all molecules, polar molecules, and the hydrogen atom of polar bond and a nearby small electronegative atom? I'm not going to answer these, but we'll let you tackle them on your own. And this question, which type of intermolecular force accounts for each of these differences? I'll let you read each of these on your own and attempt them on your own. If you like, however, I'll post a link here to a separate video in which I answer a few of them for you. That brings us to the conclusion of this lecture. Please tune into the next one in which I'll teach you more about liquids and intermolecular forces. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.